Out of all of the issues we've had over the last few years with our S10 Blazer, I'd say that there have been two major issues that have been both consistent and persistent. The first is that the steering's kind of loose. We've talked about this in quite a few episodes in the past and done some things that have improved it significantly, but it's still not quite there, and we'll tweak it a bit more in the future. But that's not what this video is about. We're going to be tackling the second major issue, and that is one of traction. This has been troubling since before even putting the V8 in the truck. Remember back when I tried to use the Blazer to pull the Datsun 280Z that a friend had just purchased off of a trailer? Well, maybe you don't, because it didn't work. It couldn't do it. All it would do was spin one solitary rear tire. And at that time, the four-wheel drive wasn't functioning correctly since the front diff wouldn't engage. We sorted that out by installing a locking cable so that we can manually engage the front differential. But most of the time that differential is not engaged and the truck isn't in four-wheel drive. Due to several things, especially including the weight distribution of the vehicle, which leaves very little weight over the rear axle, traction in two-wheel drive is hard to come by. The final straw here was when we managed to get the Blazer stuck on flat, grassy ground that was just a bit wet from the rain. Yeah, the truck actually got stuck two feet off of the driveway. That's pretty pathetic. If the front differential isn't already engaged and you get the truck stuck to the point where you can't turn the front tires, it's going to be tricky to lock that in. So unless you were planning ahead and actually prepared for this terrible traction, it's very easy to get it stuck. I mentioned that lawn incident as the final straw because not long after that we went out and got this. As the tag attached to it suggests, this is an Auburn limited slip differential. We got this rebuilt unit off of eBay for just a little over $200. Our S10 Blazer has a 10 bolt rear axle with a 7 and 5 8 inch carrier. This limited slip carrier matches that and is a 2 series which means it will fit our 308 gears. Just for kicks, here's a size comparison between on the left an 8.5 inch limited slip carrier and on the right our 7 and 5 8 inch limited slip carrier. These are both GM axles with 10 bolt covers, but most of the internals are not compatible, so you have to make sure you know which one you have. The one on the left is a factory GM posit traction unit that will be going in our 78 Firebird. The one on the right is our rebuilt Auburn unit that fits 7.5 and 7.58 and inch ring gears that we'll be installing on our S10 Blazer today. These are both clutch type limited slip carriers and function the same way even if they have different types of preload springs. We won't be getting too far into it for this episode, but basically, with a standard open differential as demonstrated time and time again by our S10 Blazer, if one tire loses traction and starts to spin, the other one will basically stop and you won't be going anywhere. The idea behind a limited slip carrier is to, well, limit the slip and even out the torque transmitted to the tires. A clutch type limited slip differential uses steel plates and friction discs very similar to those in an automatic transmission. When torque is applied to the ring gear of the carrier, it pushes out the side gears inside of it that in turn compress the clutch packs in each side of the differential carrier and essentially lock the axle shafts to the ring gear. And this clamping force only increases as more torque is applied. Hopefully the idea comes across that limited slip equals more traction, which should make it less likely that the truck will get stuck on dewy grass and cause me deep embarrassment. The rebuilt carrier we'll be installing is nice and clean and appears to have been bead blasted, but it doesn't have bearings on it, and we'll take this opportunity to go ahead and install some new ones. I doubt there's anything wrong with the ones currently in the axle, but if nothing else it'll save us a bit of time and headache removing the old ones. I decided to just replace the tapered bearing side and not the race because I'm cheap. It's generally a good idea to replace both at the same time as they kinda sorta wear mate to each other, but in this application as long as the old race is in good shape I think we'll be able to get away with it. We also have new axle shaft seals because why not? While we're doing this we might as well take the axle shafts totally out and replace those seals. But before taking anything apart, we decided to go ahead and take our new bearings and install them on our limited slip carrier. We still don't have a press in the garage or really anything else that would do this, so we'll simply be using a piece from a ball joint press kit and a hammer to install them. To make things at least a little bit easier, we'll preheat the bearings with a heat gun. 
This certainly can be done with a torch, but you want to be careful not to get anything too hot and ruin the heat treat of the steel. This free heat gun from Harbor Freight puts out a lot of heat, evenly, and it will do the trick. We clamped the heat gun in the vise and left it pointed at the bearings for a few minutes to get them nice and toasty. The bearings started at around 50 degrees Fahrenheit and we got them somewhere in the range of 180. You could certainly get them hotter than that without damage, but they become a bit difficult to handle. As for the differential carrier itself, well, we did the opposite. We left it in the freezer overnight. So instead of the room temperature of 50 degrees, it's down to about 16. Theoretically, the carrier having shrunken a little and the bearings having expanded a little will make everything easier to put together. It's at least worth a try. To top it all off, we'll spray on some WD-40 for light lubrication. Then all we have to do is plonk the bearing in place and hammer it home. We'll start with a series of lighter taps going in circles to make sure that the bearing is dropping on straight. Then we'll put a large washer over the top of the ball joint press tool and hammer straight in the middle of it. As we were losing our temperature difference and the bearing was getting installed farther and farther, it was getting to be a tight fit. If it isn't clear from the footage, we're only putting pressure on the inner race of the bearing. Definitely do not hammer on the cage or the bearing rollers themselves. After a few more hits, we can hear the bearing bottom out and we'll do a visual check to make sure it is fully installed. We'll give it one last tap to make sure and it seems like we're in good shape. So we'll flip the carrier over and do the same thing again. This time, to keep our washer from launching into orbit with every other hit, we'll simply tape it to the piece that we're using as a bearing install tool. And a few tappy taps later, being a bit more aggressive and impatient, then on the other side, the bearing is fully installed. So now we have our fresh carrier almost ready to drop right in. The next step is to bring in the blazer. This truck hasn't been driven or used too much in the last couple of months, so it's loving this new attention. Despite being very poorly tuned, it starts right up with no hesitation and runs mostly fine. And now that we have the truck in front of us, let's take a quick peek underneath. This is the original, mostly untouched, factory 10 bolt axle. For a quick overview of how S10s were equipped, to the best of my knowledge, until the 1988 model year, all of them had 7.5 inch 10 bolt rear ends. Then in 1988, they started putting the 4.3 liter in S10s, and the trucks that came with those engines and maybe some other models started coming with 7 and 5 8 rear ends. The larger ring gear itself was a bit stronger, but they also went from 26 to 28 spline axle shafts. 7.5 and 7.5 and and eighths rear ends use the same housing, so disassembly is required for a positive identification. But it's easy to tell those axles apart from an 8.5 inch 10 bolt just by looking at the housing. The smaller axles have these skinny curved ears at the bottom of the housing, while the 8.5 inch has these 90 degree angled blocks that stick out in the same area. Some of the truck axles, like this 8.6 inch under my 2007 Silverado, look similar, but are still visibly different. So before you spend a bunch of money on parts, make sure you know what you have. The last time we took it off, we painted the rusty cover on our S10's axle, but it's looking a little bit beat and some of the rust has come back through. Also, the fill bolt appears to be leaking a bit. I say fill bolt because that is a 5 8 inch bolt threaded into a nut welded to the diff cover. The original fill plug had been stripped out and this bolt and nut was the fix. I'm not gonna lie, I can't actually remember if we did that or it was already like that and maybe we just reinforced the weld? I, I don't quite remember. But the bolt's just in there with thread sealer and it seems like a little bit of oil might be seeping out over time. So for that reason, and some others that we'll talk about, we bought a new differential cover. This cover is made by Proform, and as far as I'm aware, is the cheapest cover that also doubles as a differential girdle. It has nice, easy to use drain and fill plugs, and also adds a little bit of oil capacity to the axle. But the main reason for this kind of cover is to add a little bit of strength. This cover is made from cast aluminum, and the flange area is 3 quarters of an inch thick. But the main way that this can actually strengthen an axle assembly is by supporting the bearing caps. Specifically, the differential bearing caps on either side of the carrier. 
Just like how the side gears in our limited slip carrier are pushed outwards to compress the clutches, the torque from the axle pinion is also pushing rearward on the ring gear around the carrier. And if enough force is applied, there can be some deflection in the bearing caps, which is not good. This type of cover uses these two preload studs to apply a bit of pressure and support the bearing caps, which, in theory at least, should limit deflection which decreases the chance of things breaking. If nothing else, it's a nifty looking cover with some nice features and it should be pretty sturdy. The kit includes longer bolts which you'll need to use because this cover is much thicker than the factory stamped steel one. It also includes washers and lock washers, but as you'll see in a little bit, we chose to not use the lock washers to make sure we had enough thread engagement. Some differential housings, like ours, do not have threads that extend all the way to the tops of the bolt holes. So for good engagement, the bolts might need to be a little bit longer than you would think they would need to be at first glance. With just the flat washers on them, these 5 16 inch coarse bolts that are an inch and a half long will do the trick. Instead of our TV, we're also going to be using a pre-cut gasket. There are some situations where these are not ideal, and the instructions for this cover specifically mention it's probably not the best to use one. Since it'll space the cover out a little bit more than our TV would, it might have something to do with bolt thread engagement, or maybe because with this type of gasket, there's just another thing in the system to flex. But after using these gaskets a few times instead of RTV, I have to say I like the experience a lot better. And we're just gonna go with the old time-tested approach. Eh, it's probably fine. And now that I've talked enough to fill an entire episode, put down your pitchforks and torches, we're actually going to work on this thing. Since we're going to be removing the axle shafts, it is advisable to lift the car off the ground. We'll lift it up pretty high to give us enough room to work on everything. And with the frame set down on jack stands, we'll start by removing the wheels. Now this isn't strictly necessary, but since we want to totally remove the axle shafts and replace the seals, this will make that a lot easier. And once both of the wheels are off, we can remove the brake drums. We've taken these off a few times, although not recently, but luckily they don't put up a fight. And now we'll roll underneath and remove the differential cover. The brake line and its brackets are a little bit in the way and we'll just have to be careful. We replaced these brake lines a few years ago and they are nickel copper so they're very flexible. Even though the new cover is much thicker I don't imagine we'll have any trouble with fitting anything. We'll go around and remove the bolts in a crisscross pattern leaving one in the top and one in the bottom about halfway threaded in. These are just so that we can pry the cover loose without worrying about it cannonballing into the drain pan below. We had previously sealed the cover with RTV and luckily didn't use too much so it breaks loose pretty easily. We'll let most of the fluid drain out and then we can remove those two bolts and the cover itself. We'll carefully slide out the cover between the ring gear and the brake line bracket. And there is the open differential that came in this truck. We'll use a razor blade scraper to clean up the gasket surface and luckily the RTV just slides off. Pretty soon we have that surface cleaned up and we'll take a close look at our gears. Despite having been driven over 200,000 miles, everything in here is looking great. On the outside of the ring gear, we can just barely make out the factory markings. It reads 1340, which refers to 40 teeth on the ring gear and 13 on the pinion that gives us our 308 ratio, and 7 and 5 8 inches, which is the diameter of the ring gear. And now that we've been able to confirm what the parts are in here, we know our new differential carrier will fit. And the first step to disassembling this axle is to remove the cross pin retaining bolt. That's this little bolt on the side of the carrier with the 5 16 inch head. It takes a bit of effort to loosen, which is very good because it's definitely not something you want falling out, but pretty soon we can slide out the bolt which frees up the cross pin. As you can see, the pin is now loose, so we'll rotate the carrier a bit so we can easily drop it out. And the pin drops right out. The cross pin holds the C-clips in place on the axle shafts, as well as provides an axis for the spider gears to spin upon, which is why when we spin the differential back around to access the C-clips, one of those spider gears falls out. In order to remove the axle shafts, first we have to remove the C-clips that retain them. Doing this is always unnervingly easy. All you need to do is push in the axle shaft just a little bit to expose the C-clip. You can remove the clip just by lifting it out with a magnet. Then you pull outwards on the axle shaft and slide it free of the carrier. The axle shafts only need to be slid out a few inches in order to remove the differential carrier, but since we're replacing the axle shaft seals, we'll go ahead and totally remove them. They will slide straight out of the axles, just support them while doing so. 
Also, be prepared for the oily mess. Before putting things back together, we'll have to carefully clean up the insides of our brake drum assemblies to make sure that the gear oil doesn't get on our braking surfaces. And once we chase the dog away from the gear oil, we can repeat this process on the other side. Axle shaft gets pushed in, C-clip gets removed, axle shaft gets pulled out. It's as simple as that. With how easy it is to remove these axle shafts, it's pretty obvious why C-clip eliminator kits are so popular and at a lot of drag strips required as a safety upgrade. But today we'll just be reusing the C-clips because for our use in this vehicle, I think we'll be okay. With the axle shafts removed, we'll take a close look at them. The axle shaft bearing and seal surfaces look just fine. It wouldn't be a bad idea to do some polishing here, but in this case we're just going to leave these surfaces alone. It doesn't appear that the old seals leaked, certainly not significantly, so we should be okay just dropping new seals in. We are also able to confirm that these are in fact 28 spline axles, which means our new carrier with its 28 splines should drop right into place of the old one. But before we get back to the carrier, we'll go ahead and replace our axle seals. We started trying to get them out using a seal puller, but the sharp tip just wanted to tear through the steel cladding. So we switched to a nice long pry bar which got the seal moving, and using a hammer to tap sideways on the pry bar, pop the seal right out. The wheel bearings are most likely factory, but they appear to be in perfectly good shape, so we're going to leave them in place. We'll use a bit of carb cleaner and a paper towel to get that seal surface nice and clean. Then we'll place a new seal over the end of the axle and use a different piece from our ball joint press kit to hammer it in. We'll tap around the edge a little bit at a time, making sure we're pushing the seal in straight. And we'll keep checking how everything is going. When fully installed, the new seal should be just below flush with the surface of the tube. The inner edge is beveled and the seal should be right at the base of that. And there we go, our new seal is fully installed, so we'll do the same thing on the other side. This time we just went right for the big pry bar and reefed on it, which caused the seal to leap right out. We'll clean up that surface, install the new seal, and once that one is fully installed, we'll lubricate the seals on both ends of the axle with a bit of gear oil. Then just using carb cleaner and a shop towel, we'll wipe the axles clean. Once things are looking good, we'll slide the axle shaft back into the axle tube. Once it's partially installed, we'll lubricate the end and the seal and bearing surface with some more gear oil. Then we'll slide the shaft in just shy of the carrier and leave it there for now. And of course, the other axle shaft will get the same cleaning, installation, and oiling procedure. And with that taken care of, we'll get back to the carrier. The only things still holding the carrier and the axle are the two bearing caps. Just like connecting rod caps, we want to make sure these get reinstalled the same way they are currently installed. So we'll take a punch and mark both bearing caps and the differential case beside them. The lower end of the driver's side bearing cap will get a number one, as will the housing ceiling surface right beside it. And in the same place on the other side, we will put a two. So when these are reinstalled, the digits should match up and be in line with one another. And now that we're sure we can get them back on in the same orientation, we'll grab the impact gun and remove the bolts, retaining the bearing caps. We'll start by loosening the bolts, then we can wiggle the caps and break them loose, and remove them totally from the housing. Once we remove the second cap, we have to hold the carrier up into the case because it will try to drop right out. We'll grab the carrier, its bearing races, and its shims, and pull that out altogether. And with it out of the vehicle, we can finally take a close look at everything. The bearings look good. Not just good, but almost brand new. They're Timken bearings, which I know GM has used for some vehicles, but I'm not sure whether or not these are actually original. Either way, they're in immaculate shape and look pretty much brand new, so I have no qualms about reusing the races. If I had the time to fight with the old bearings, or the tools to remove them easily from the old carrier, I would have no qualms about reusing them. Before moving on, we'll also make note of the factory shims and their locations. Our carrier had a shim with five yellow stripes on the driver's side, and one with four white stripes on the passenger side. The two shims are of different thicknesses, and I assume the number of lines as well as the color of them indicates their sizing. With the position of the shims noted, we'll put them and the bearing races aside for now. The next thing we have to do is remove the ring gear from the differential carrier. 
The ring gear is retained by 10 7 16 inch fine thread bolts that are left hand thread. We'll use the impact gun to go around in a crisscross pattern and remove all of the bolts. I don't know about you, but every time I come across them, left hand thread fasteners always trip me up. So take your time and make sure you're turning things the right way. Which is, you know, the left way in this case. Pretty soon we have all of the bolts removed, but as the ring gear is press fit onto the carrier, it won't just fall off. To remove it, we'll go around in circles, tapping around on the outside edge of the ring gear with a pry bar and a hammer. It helps tremendously to have a trusting person to hold it in place while you're doing this. We just kept hammering around in circles until there was a big enough gap to fit two pry bars in. Then by aligning the two bars opposite of each other, we were easily able to push the ring gear the rest of the way off. We'll clean the ring gear up a bit and make sure the inner surface as well as the flat face of it are very clean. Then it's ready to be installed on our Auburn Limited Slip Carrier. And with that set on a clean towel on the floor, we'll drop the ring gear onto it. Holding the ring gear in place, we'll thread in some of the bolts. We're just threading them in finger tight for the moment to line up the ring gear with the holes in the carrier. And once four of those are in place, we'll flip the carrier back over and use a mallet to get the ring gear partially seated. Once again, we're going around in circles to make sure that it gets pressed down flat. Then we can tighten the bolts a bit more and everything is close enough that we will just be using the bolts to draw it the rest of the way on. We'll install a few more bolts and tighten them just a little bit at a time going back and forth until the ring gear appears to be fully seated. And once the ring gear is fully in place, we'll remove the bolts and clean off all the oil. Now, the plan was to lock tight these bolts in and get everything torqued down before installing it in the vehicle. To help hold the carrier in place, we removed the cross pin and slid through a half inch socket extension. That combined with a foot holding it in place did a good job of keeping it from moving. The problem was, the torque I was putting on the wrench didn't feel right. Looking around online, I saw quite a few different torque specs for these bolts, but we decided to go with 65 foot-pounds. It sure felt like I was putting at least that much on the wrench when trying to tighten these down, but since things were moving a little bit, it was hard to tell. And I got worried about over-torquing them, so we decided to do final torque on the bolts once it was installed in the vehicle. It wasn't long after trying to torque these on the floor that I realized that this wrench only clicks in the clockwise direction. It ratchets both ways, but it's only actually measuring torque when tightening a right hand thread fastener. That wrench doesn't get used much and I guess I'd never tried to torque anything but a standard fastener with it. This is yet another good example of why it pays to really understand the tools that you're working with. And even if you are using a torque wrench, that doesn't mean you don't have to pay attention to what you're doing, and if something doesn't feel right, sometimes just go with your instincts. So we loosen up all the bolts and tighten them down just a little bit to keep them in place. Then we'll get back to continuing reassembly and we'll pre-lube our new differential bearings. Since these bearings sit in an oil bath, we don't have to pack them with grease or anything, we'll just make sure there's a bit of gear oil on all of the rollers. And we'll drop back on the bearing races. The next step is to heft the carrier back up into the axle housing. I was kind of hoping to just get lucky and be able to reuse the factory shims, but no such luck. They were a little bit too thick. At this point in the day I was pretty tired and I didn't feel like lifting the carrier in and out of the axle housing trying to figure out the shims. So I figured we would just use some silver differential adhesive tape to loosely hold it in place. And with it held in our high-tech fixture, it's time to break out a differential carrier shim kit. Unfortunately, the ones I had had been sitting on a shelf for a long time, apparently without a coating of factory oil, so some of them were a bit rusty. But a few minutes of bench top scrubbing with some WD-40 and a Scotch-Brite pad cleared that right up. Going by the cheapo calipers, the old shims each measured about 0.24 inches. The shim set includes four that are each a tenth of an inch thick, and a bunch of thinner shims that appear to be about one one hundredth of an inch thick. There appeared to be a little bit of variation in the thickness of some of these, which I wasn't sure if it was intentional or not, so when you're trying to shim these things, do try some different combinations. The first step to shimming a differential carrier is to figure out how much total clearance you need to fill in. Basically, keep sliding shims in until the last one is a snug but not ridiculously tight fit. It helps to move the carrier and bearing races around a bit when doing this. 
once it feels like everything is about right, make sure to move the carrier around a bit, since the weight of the carrier pulling down could push the tapered bearings out and take up space that you really want to be filling in with shims. Once it seems like we have a good number of shims, and when pushing forward on it, the carrier doesn't move at all left or right, we can say that the total number of shims is correct. Our starting point is 23 thousandths worth of shims on the driver's side and 20 on the passenger side. So the total thickness is 43 thou. The next thing we have to do is measure the amount of backlash between the ring and pinion gears. And to measure this, we need to reinstall and torque the bearing caps. We'll line up and match up the numbers we punched into each cap earlier, thread in four oiled bolts, and going back and forth, carefully snug them all up. Then we'll torque each of the four bolts to 60 foot-pounds. Before we get to measuring backlash, now that the carrier is securely held in place, we're gonna go ahead and torque down those ring gear bolts for good this time. Since we already went around and pulled the ring gear all the way to the carrier, we're not going to crisscross tighten these, although it would be ideal. What we'll do is remove the bolts two at a time, put fresh Loctite on the bolts, reinstall them, then we'll torque them back down to 50 foot-pounds using a pry bar in the drive shaft yoke to hold everything in place. And this time we were torquing the bolts with a wrench that actually works in both directions. Once all of them had been Loctited and torqued to 50, we went around one more time and torqued them all down to 65 foot-pounds. This was a little slow, and it definitely would have been easier to do without the differential in the vehicle, but we still managed to get it done and got all of those bolts torqued down. And now that everything has finally been secured, we can check the amount of backlash. To do this, we're going to use a dial indicator clamped to the bottom of the differential housing, with the pintle set up against the end of one of the teeth on the gear. For an accurate measurement, you want to get the dial indicator as close to perpendicular with the gear tooth surface as possible. With that in place, we'll put a wrench on one of the ring gear bolts and rock the carrier back and forth. Unfortunately, we can't measure the backlash because our starting position ended up with zero. The gears are actually pressed against each other a little bit, and if run like this, the teeth and bearings would wear rapidly, and in the worst case situation, when everything starts to heat up, they could expand and cause the differential to lock up and or break teeth. So we need to increase the amount of backlash between the gears. We can do that by moving the ring gear away from the pinion by moving around some shims. Since our initial spacing was 23 thousandths on the driver's side and 20 on the passenger side, we decided to take two shims out of the driver's side and trade them over. Therefore, we'd be moving the ring gear two thousandths of an inch farther away from the pinion gear without changing the overall thickness of the shims. To trade them over, we'll loosen up all four of the bearing cap bolts, then remove the two on the driver's side, the bearing cap, and our shim stack. We'll take out two of the shims that we're going to trade over to the passenger side and reinstall our stack up. The order of the shims probably doesn't matter, but I would feel the most comfortable with the thicker shims on the outside and the thin shims in the center of them. And once the shims are back in place, we'll reinstall the bearing cap and just very loosely install the bolts. Then we'll remove the passenger side bearing cap, slide in our additional two shims, and reinstall it. Then, just like before, we'll go around and torque the four bearing caps down to 60 foot-pounds. We can immediately tell that there is now a backlash present and things are feeling a lot better than they did. So we'll set back up the dial indicator and see what it has to say. Well, it's definitely better than before, but now it actually has too much backlash. A little bit too much is better than none, but we can do better. So we're going to trade one of the shims from the passenger side back to the driver's side. We'll repeat the whole process to do so, and once the shims are back in, we'll have 22 thousandths on the driver's side and 21 thousandths on the passenger side. And it's looking much, much better. It appears that we have about 8 thousandths of backlash between the gears. For most differential sets, this is within spec, but for whatever reason, the 7 and 5 8 axles actually have a slightly tighter tolerance here. The spec that I saw in most places for these is three to six thousandths. We're just a hair over that, but with the shims that we had on hand, this is as close as we're going to get. Once the bearings wear in, it'll likely increase a little bit more, but even then, I don't suspect that we'll have any issues. For one last check, I kinda wanted to check the mesh pattern between the pinion and ring gear. Unfortunately, I didn't have any proper oil paint on hand, which is really what you want to use for this. 
I cleaned up a few of the gear teeth as best I could and used some acrylic paint since it's what I had sitting around. The idea here is to cover a few of the gear teeth, then spin the carrier around a few times and see where the pinion is taking the paint off of the ring gear. The acrylic paint didn't really like the smooth, probably still slightly oily steel surface, so we didn't get a clear pattern, but from the paint that did get spread around, it looked like everything was doing okay. It looked like there was good contact along the length of the teeth and approximately in the center of them, not all the way out on the edge. Since we didn't remove the pinion and change the shims that it's using, theoretically this shouldn't have changed at all. We changed the carrier, which is why we had to re-shim it, but either way, the axis that this ring gear rotates upon shouldn't have changed at all. So, theoretically, the way the pinion is meshing with the ring gear should be just as it was before, as set at the factory. And as near as we can tell with the crappy paint, everything seems okay, so we'll go ahead and move on. The rest of the installation is, of course, the reverse of the removal. We'll start by sliding back in both axle shafts. They should pretty much slide in, but they might need a little bit of a twist to line all the splines up. There's the passenger side fully slid in, and there's the driver side as well. Now we can spin one of those sides and see that the whole carrier is not only turning easily, but both axle shafts are turning in the same direction. Thanks to the preload springs in the carrier, even without torque coming through the drive shaft, the side gears are still pressed outward enough that both shafts spin in the same direction. So, at least as far as we can test at this point, the carrier seems to be functioning correctly. And now, to lock the axle shafts in place, we'll reinstall each of our two C-clips. With the driver side clip in place, we can pull the axle outward and lock it in. Then, in goes the passenger side C-clip, and the shaft can be pulled outward. Then, all we have to do is slide the cross pin back into the carrier, apply a nice dollop of Loctite onto the cross pin retaining bolt, and thread it in. It's not really possible to use a torque wrench for this, so we'll just use a standard combination wrench and get it nice and tight. With the axle shaft held in place, we'll link together two wrenches to get a good amount of torque on the bolt. It is fairly small and could cause catastrophic damage if it backed out. But we're satisfied with how everything has gone together up to this point, and it's time to install the differential cover. First up, we'll give the ceiling surface of the housing one more cleaning. We'll slide two bolts through the cover and put the gasket on top of those so it's held in place. Then we can position the cover and get those bolts started. And once the cover is hanging on those two bolts, we'll install the rest and also reinstall the brake drums. Ow! Sorry. Ow! Did not realize you were there. Where else would I be? I don't know. It hit like right on the end of my knee. You have long legs. That hurt way more than that should have hurt. Ow! From the factory, these lock nuts were tightened down on the preload studs, so we'll go ahead and remove them and back the studs out a bit to make sure they're not touching the bearing caps when we tighten the cover down. With the studs backed out all the way, we'll go around and install the rest of the cover bolts. Each of the bolts got just a touch of anti-seize on their threads. Once they're all in place, including the ones that hold the brake line brackets, we'll go around in a crisscross pattern and snug them down. Then we'll go around and torque each of those bolts to 20 foot-pounds. The instructions for the cover said 25, but I put anti-seize on the threads, so we'll stay on the safe side for these relatively small bolts and go with 20. The top rightmost bolt with that thin rusty brake line bracket wasn't really cooperating, and every time I tried to hold the bracket in place it was just bending, so I figure we'll just leave it alone and zip tie the brake line down to it later. Now that the cover has been secured to the housing, we'll screw back in the bearing preload studs. When they're all the way in, they'll be pressing against the center of the bearing caps and supporting them. And once they're finger tight, we'll tighten each of them down to 10 foot-pounds. Too much pressure and you'll end up distorting the caps and damaging the bearings. Once each of the studs has been torqued down with a hex key socket, we'll apply a little bit of RTV around the base of each side, per the instructions, and thread back on the lock nuts. The RTV is just to ensure a positive seal around the studs. And after letting it cure for a minute, we'll come back with the torque wrench and tighten each lock nut down to 10 foot-pounds. And we're nearing the finish line. All of that setup is done. Now we'll loosen up the fill plug and completely remove the drain plug so that we can put some thread sealer on it and tighten it back down. The sealer just provides that little bit of extra protection against leaks. We'll just use a regular ratchet to tighten these down by feel. 
We'll clean up any extra sealer and RTV around the lock nuts. And finally, we'll remove the fill plug and get ready to add oil. After we go back and zip tie down the brake line, of course. Much better. Since this is a clutch type limited slip, it absolutely needs limited slip additive or special limited slip gear oil. We'll be adding a bottle of AC Delco limited slip axle lubricant to ours. This is used for factory GM limited slips and has a good reputation. The job of a limited slip additive is maybe not what you would think, it's actually to allow a little bit of slip. It helps the clutches slide smoothly to prevent chattering when the vehicle is turning and moving at low speeds. This chatter is not only unpleasant, but it will dramatically shorten the life of the clutches. For my research, it's generally recommended that this additive and the gear oil be changed every 30 to 50,000 miles. And since we're using an additive, I didn't get special limited slip oil, we're just using regular ADW90. Since I had somehow three half empty bottles sitting around, I'm not entirely sure how much it took to actually fill up this differential, but it was definitely more than the stock cover. Once the axle is full, oil will start dripping out from the fill hole. We'll wipe off that excess oil, put some thread sealer on the fill plug, and install it. We'll get that nice and tight, wipe off the excess thread sealer, and we're done. It sure took a long time to talk through this process, but really, installing this differential was not very difficult. And since I was able to get a good price on a remanufactured limited slip unit, and bought the cheapest differential cover of this style, all things considered it wasn't too expensive. Between the carrier, the new bearings, and the cover, the total price was around $350. It's worth noting that a lot of people don't really mess with this stuff and would rather just go out and get a complete axle. And if you're in the right place at the right time, you probably could get an axle like this for about that price. But it's nice to know that we have new clutches in our unit and we have the experience of having done it ourselves. We'll go ahead and reinstall the wheels, and after we snug down the lug nuts, we can see that turning one turns the other side in the same direction. And, well, there you have it. The Blazer now has a limited slip rear differential. Clearly, it works. We were able to torque the lug nuts by just holding the wheel on the other side, and the whole time the wheel wanted to turn in the same direction as the other side. And I'm glad we were able to show you this test because there's no other way to test if something like this works. There's really just nothing we could do. So unfortunately, I guess we just have to end the video there. We'll never know whether or not this limited slip actually works. Uh, good goodbye. Thanks, thanks for watching. You can, you, you can go now. I guess we're all done. Okay, fine. Don't give me those puppy dog eyes. Let's take it out to the field and make sure it actually works. did it spin both tires evenly and predictably the whole time, it didn't actually stop spinning the tires until I let off the gas. But maybe it was a fluke. Let's try it again on this mound of dirt and grass. It seems to be working pretty well. But after all, the truck is a four-wheel drive, let's see what happens if we give it some gas with the front axle actually powered. It appears as though all four tires spun. It's a little bit hard to tell about the front right, but more importantly, I was expecting them to spin more. It actually gripped fairly quickly and really just wanted to take off. Having the majority of the vehicle's weight over the front axle gives a pretty good amount of grip to those front tires. In this high speed shot, you can see the body squat back pretty far, loading up the rear axle and getting everything moving. Everything is actually working startlingly well, 
When filming this, the only minor issue I had was when I got both front wheels wedged in groundhog holes. The truck was in two-wheel drive and wouldn't go forward anymore, just spinning both back tires in the mud, but popping it in reverse pulled it right out of there and that was the closest I got to getting stuck. The ground was pretty wet and without that limited slip, I probably would have gotten it stuck two or three times just trying to film those shots. I may have even had to get another truck to pull it out of those groundhog holes. But thanks to that limited slip, it did great. As of posting this video, I've put around 200 miles on that limited slip carrier and have noticed no issues. It's perfectly smooth when cornering, and I haven't noticed any weird noises, although the blazer is very loud on the highway, so it's a little hard to tell, honestly. It seems to have resolved that major issue of traction that this truck always suffered from. In terms of usefulness, this was an even bigger upgrade than dropping the V8 in the truck. We've got some plans for the future to continue making this truck more and more fun, but we're actually going to end this episode here, so we'll just have to wait and see what we get done next time.